instead of just focusing on logos, I would tell people to really focus on um, the identity piece first because a logo is it's like the salami on a charcuterie board, right? It's just a, it's just a piece, right? It's not the full it's not the full board. Welcome to Midland Money Mindset, your weekly dose of inspiration and insights to ensure you enjoy each step of your journey. Whether you're saving for the future, planning your next big adventure, or simply looking to add more joy to your life, you've come to the right place. Now, let's dive in. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Josh Passler, widely known as the Fin Artist. Josh Passler is a trailblazer in the world of financial artistry, uniquely blending the analytical rigor of finance with the expressive beauty of art. With a background in finance and a passion for visual storytelling, Josh has carved out a niche that transforms complex financial concepts into engaging and accessible works of art. His unique perspective and creative flair have made him a sought-after voice for those looking to understand and appreciate finance in a whole new light. As the fin artist, Josh not only creates visually stunning pieces, but also educates and inspires his audience by demystifying financial topics through his art. His work has captivated and empowered individuals to see the world of finance as a source of creativity and inspiration rather than just numbers and spreadsheets. Join us as we dive into Josh's fascinating journey, exploring the innovative ways he merges finance and art, and discover how his unique approach can transform your understanding of money. Well, I have the pleasure today of being with Josh Passler, the Finn artist. And uh, yeah, a little bit of a tongue twister, but Finn, an artist, he put it together and he is the Finn artist. So we're going to talk a lot about what you're doing today, Josh, and uh, spend a lot of time on that. But I am so enamored by the entrepreneurial journey. Perhaps you could give our listeners a little background about you and, you know, how did you get up to the point of being the Finn artist? And then we'll spend a great deal of time there, of course. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so my journey is is very unorthodox. It, th- there was no marketing strategy behind it. It was kind of just sheer luck, I guess you could say. But you know, I was a financial advisor uh, here in Omaha for I guess my journey was about eight and a half years before I found FinArt. And FinArt really just came out of nowhere. It it started as more of a a networking tool for me. I was creating these portraits on Twitter and LinkedIn because I found about the whole FinTwit LinkedIn community. And I really wanted to add more value to my name. So that's how it all started. It was, instead of just communicating and messaging random advisors and planners to you know, hop on a call or to pick their brain, I wanted to add value. So I started just sketching them uh, just from like a, like a comic style to uh, a portrait style of them. And it just took off one day and it's where it has, it it, it is where it is now. And it's a, it's been a a fun, great journey. So have you been an entrepreneur your entire life or is this something that you just stepped into? I I guess being a financial advisor in some ways, depending on how that looked for you, you might've been somewhat of an entrepreneur there. So I don't know if it started there or did even start your, your entrepreneurial journey start even prior to that? It really started with FinR. I think I had a little bit of snippets along the way, um, li- little things that, you know, that wasn't really official, I guess you could say. But, you know, the, the, the FinR thing, you know, obviously I had to communicate it with my wife and, and say, hey, is, is, this, is this marketable? Is this something that we can, it can be profitable? Should we run with it and see where it can lead us to? And, and so uh, about six months in, after I started it, I, I was like, you know what? I'm no longer going to be an advisor. I'm just going to run with it and and just see what happens and and start planning for the future. So, yeah, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is still alive. It's hungrier than ever. So I love it. Now, did you just uh, did, were you still working as a financial advisor as you transitioned or did you really just stop cold as a financial advisor and then make that transition to the uh the fin art side it was like a a gradual decrease in the workload of a financial planner 
got to the point where I was, I, I, uh, I, uh, registered, I, I took all my licenses and, and designations over to uh, core planning. Um, and so I'm, I'm technically still registered. Uh, but I started handing off clients to the other planners and it got to the point where I was like, you know what? Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part-time planner. Like that, that would be a huge disservice to the client. And I think not having that focus and attention on their planning would, would be detrimental to them and to me. And it just, I I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Right. So I had to make sure that they got the attention that they deserved. So uh, with that being said, I I really focused in on thin art and really it was just, it was portraits, many, many, like hundreds of portraits for the first few months. And then it led to illustrations uh, up to where it is now. And right now it's more about the brain identity design be you know, to, to create for firms. Yeah. So let, let's talk about that a little bit, right? Because, yeah, and I was going to go there. So thank you for leading me in that direction, right? Because you, you talked about making these uh, uh, cartoonish sketches of advisors to kind of get their attention. But that was really just a lead in, right? That's more or less like in uh, in shopping terms, you'd say that was somewhat of a loss leader, right? To to get their attention, bring them in. So maybe you could give our listeners a little bit of a, a 360 view of what FinArt does, what they're all about and, and what what you're doing today, in addition to the great sketches of, uh, you know, advisors out there. Absolutely. So uh, the thin art is primarily focusing on brand identity design. Um, I would say primarily focusing on the you know the fin serve industry, uh, and that's where a majority of our clients come from. It's helpful that we have this background of being a financial advisor for years because there's not much explaining that needs to be done, uh, you know, with with financial concepts and financial terms. Right? We can figure we we understand it, so it's easier for our clients to. Uh, work with us because they don't have to go in depth and explain when we're building out visual concepts on their website or on, on graphics. Right. Uh, so it's, it's really about building out that brand identity and that's where our main focus is right now. So 360 really is just a brand identity with some illustrations and concepts projects still on the table. Um, like I, I, I technically am still doing uh, the Fifty Fires podcast covers for their for their guests uh, mm-hmm. for Carl, so that's a lot of fun. I still go to conferences every once in a while and uh, make these uh, unique portraits specifically for those conferences. Uh, but I guess the nine to five is the brand identity. It's it's more like yeah, you know, like eight eight a.m. to eight p.m. because eight p.m. I need to cut off because my brain doesn't work as creatively as it was at eight a.m. Right. There you go. You're going to end up on Shark Tank like uh, I, I forget that guy's name, right? There was there's a guy who did the uh, the cat drawings, right? Very uh, different, but similar, I guess, to some degree. And uh, I think Mark Cuban invested in that company. We're, we're a big Shark Tank family. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll see you on there eventually. So listen, one of the things I hear you talk about is color a lot. And, uh, you know, why, why do you feel that color uh, really needs to be the starting point for your design and branding? You know, what, what's the, the purpose behind that or what's your uh, guiding principle there? Yeah, I, it, you know, it, it really is all, all about color psychology. But the simplest way is the emotions that you give from looking at a certain color. You know, like when I look at your shirt, I immediately think of, you know, that, that blue, you can think of trust, safety, um, but is bright enough to where you feel, you know, happy, right? So... Mm-hmm. And you get that from your personality. So the personality and that color matches up perfectly, right? Um, you know, when you think of Coca-Cola, you think about that red and you think about, you know, what it, what it brings to the table. You always, you can always trust that Coke to taste exactly like it tasted back in 1930 if you're around back then. Um, you know, well, with the recipe changing a little bit. But for the most part, you know, the, the colors is the first thing that your brain acknowledges, Right. So when you look at any sort of brain, when you look outside, you know, the first thing you think of when you look at like trees is you think of green, you see it, you feel it, you can smell it. Then without color, you don't get any of that. Um, So that's how important color is is because, well, your brain acknowledges it. It'll see it, feel it. All the senses come alive. And that's why, why that's why it's more important than the actual logo. 
So are, are there key colors for financial folks or for FinArt that, um, you know, you see more often or should see more often as a, uh, you know, being utilized or that you utilize on a regular basis? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, everyone has probably already answered that question in their own minds when they, when they heard that question, but you know, blue and green are very, very popular colors. Green is money security. Uh, blue is, 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 is the same, but blue has more of that trust. That's why you see a lot of banks with blue, like different shades and tints of, of blue, right? Uh, but the green, the money piece, the safety piece is, is huge as well. Um, you know, you do see a lot of, and you see quite a bit of red too. So I would say three primaries are red, blue, and green uh, within our industry. And, and for a good reason too, because they do, they do offer that security, but it's getting to the point where like any industry is becoming oversaturated by just a couple of colors. And mm-hmm. so the ones that have a different hue, like they have a purple, they have a pink, they have a, uh, you know, a, well, I was going to say gold, but gold is pretty common too. They have like a, let's say like a bright yellow, like let's say, let's say like a neon yellow. It really stands out. It makes you stop and think and, it that's what that's the best piece of it is that it makes you stop and think and wonder what is this company doing that's different right. how are they how are their products and services different from yours right how are they a different you know advisor are they the same you know what what are they really what message are they trying to get across and so um and that's why my company is pink um i played around with the different shades and tints of pink but i wanted it to stand out i actually I was heavily influenced by Robert Sophia's book. Um, and that's how I, I remember reading it one day. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, if I ever start a company, I'm going to make it pink because of that book. Yeah. And yeah. lo and behold, it's here. And so thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. <laughs> and he's heard it, I, I think, the many times before. All right. Well, uh, we'll definitely give him a shout out in the show notes for you for sure. And, you know, one of the things you said earlier, and and I couldn't agree more, right, is, you know, this branding or this art, you know, the color is important because, like you said, with my shirt, it may give you the feeling of safety, security, but it also gives you that joy component. Also, there's feelings that are are tied in there. So, I mean, are there key elements that need to be in or should be in your branding, you know, whether you're in financial services or any other profession? I guess it's similar, right? It might be different colors and different feelings you're trying to uh, get people to emote. But at the end of the day, you're really trying to get them to feel connected to your brand, your company, your values, your mission, et cetera. So what are the key elements needed for you know a business to get people to feel the branding rather than just see it? That's a great point. So after colors, the shapes play a huge part into that. Uh, shapes can really be a, a, a factor in how people perceive what the brand is about. Uh, a perfect example is when you look at uh, any sort of like moving company or or NASCAR or any like fast paced uh, moving product, they always have like this italic look to it. They have that slanted uh, rectangle for the most part, and that's the perceived movement, right? Um, but if you're trying to be loud, bold, you want this like very like large box. You want straight cut edges on your brand. Um, if you're going for security, you know a perfect one is is really a upside down triangle. Um, that way it looks more like a shield. Um, that that's a perfect one too. But if they're trying to be soft, if they're trying to warm it up like a children's product, right? They have more rounded edges, right? They have a softer tone. They have uh, more of like a palette color. They have um, you know, there are, even their typography that they use are uh, are going to be like rounded edges too. So typically, you want your you want the shapes to match the typography too. So there's different ways you can do it, right? Um, you know, when I look at your book, for instance, in the background, you know, you can already tell like this is a, even though it's a finance book, it's made personal. And so if if you want to have like that conversation, that one on one with them through a book, right? you got to have that warm, inviting feeling. And those colors do that immediately, right? It's very disarming. Like, so when they pick it up, they're not going to feel like it's a, I mean, no offense, but it's, it's not going to feel like a Morgan Housel book, right? It's going right. to feel like, hey, this is this is made for me. 
And this is going to give me the stories and the personal testaments to, to help me get to where I need to be, right? To help me learn. So, you know, I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but everyone does. And right. they have to judge. So that's that's how it, it can all play together. Yeah. Listen, the covers are very important because we work, uh, one of the areas that we work with are with uh, with authors, you know, and typically in the, in the romance uh, genre. And we've had authors tell us that they've released a book with one cover, uh, doesn't necessarily hit and, and or they change the cover or they put it out in two different distribution formats with two different covers. And ultimately, one ends up outselling the other just with a little change of the cover can, uh, you know, generate sales. Because if you think about it, most people are buying their books online these days, right? Uh, you know, not a lot of people are going to the library or the bookstore and holding it and leafing through it. They're really looking at that cover and saying, does this speak to me enough that I'm going to either buy it or pay, pay, take it off the shelves and start reading it, right? So you have to... You have to be able to catch them there, which, uh, you know, I think you, you laid out very nicely. So, you know, one of the things that you work with, you know, is this branding component for businesses. So how do you walk people, firms through the process of uncovering if their branding speaks to them? Right. Because I, I think to some degree you have to make this branding speak to the owner, the stakeholders first. Right. So they, they can get behind it and then show it off to the world and then hopefully attract uh, families that uh, they're in alignment with. So how, how do you walk people through that process and making sure that that speaks to them before, you know, unleashing it to the world? Great question. There's, there's really no secret sauce. And I will say this for, for the firms I've worked with, it's almost the same process that they have with their own clients. Right. And because everyone's trying to figure out that why behind the why behind the why, you know, what really got them started? Why are they there in front of you? Why do they want to be your client? Why do you want to, why do you want to be their advisor? Right. Um, that's the most important part. You got to figure out their pain points. You're you know, we're, we're trying to solve business issues with design, what we're trying to accomplish here. And that's what I always tell them. So just having that open discussion and figuring out exactly like, hey, what are you here for? How can we help? Tell us your story. We want to hear your story because, it, you know, everyone loves to tell their story. I love to listen to stories and figure out, okay, what part along the way in your journey did you, you know, did you not spend enough time on, you know, what you're here for and why has that changed? Why are you here now and what are you trying to solve? So we have, you know, from our questionnaires that we provide them to our, our brand workshop calls, um, you know, we, we gather enough information with research and discovery to figure out exactly why they are here. Why are they in front of us? Because realistically, everybody wants to make money, right? That's like the, that's a number one goal in business is to be profitable. But there's something underlying that, made them become an advisor in the first place that's setting them apart from another advisor if we figure that out we can then create a design around that instead of just the money aspect of being profitable right and right. if we can design the underlying you know passion you know if you, if you want to say passion we can bring that to light and we can make sure that it ties in with our target audience and when the target audience sees that, they can now say that advisor, that firm is meant for me based on what I'm seeing here within the first seven seconds. All right. Yeah. Great points. You know, how do you tell, I, I guess, you know, if you have a firm who's looking to kind of get things moving in the right direction, right? And, and sometimes it's not a matter of we got to do everything from scratch where we have to do like a total rebrand. Sometimes it's like, hey, this advisor, this firm. They, they have good fundamentals, but they kind of need a refresh, right? They, they just need to freshen things up. So how do you, as a, as a business owner, and I, you know, I, I think that many of these concepts we're talking about are very transferable, whether you're a financial professional or you run a local business or even a larger business, I think a lot of them are transferable. So how, how do you know whether or not you simply need a refresh or actually you should really start from the, the drawing board and do a total uh, rebrand. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've worked with a, a few firms 
that do not need a rebrand. They just need a refresh, right? And the refresh comes, you know, because they have amazing foundations. They have the building blocks in place. You know, they're not reaching a hundred million in AUM from nothing, right? There's there's reasons why they've reached certain milestones. There's there's you know reasons why they've been decades or a decade in, in practice, right? So understanding that is huge too. But we also have to really dig in and make sure the client's 100% honest with us and themselves on what's not working. You have a lot of things that are working great, but what's really not working with your firm? And sometimes, you know, advisors and graphic designers, you know, we, we kind of have to act as a, like a therapist almost, right? You know, almost like a Dr. Phil, you know, just like, why, why are you the way that you are now? But uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we have to dig in deep. Um, and if a person has a great foundation, you know, and they're like, I don't know if I need a rebrand. Well, you're right. You don't need a rebrand. You have like in, in the perfect example I, I give of a refresh is you have an amazing house. You have amazing foundation. You, you know, yeah, maybe your siding needs to change. Maybe you had the hailstorm that dented up a little bit over time because your house is like 20 years old. You need a new, uh, you know, a new paint. Maybe let's change up the interior a little bit. Maybe let's get a, you know, a new address sign so people can see your address more clearly when they drive by for delivery or for parties. Maybe we, uh, we get a new stove in or, uh, or a, a better island so people can in the congregate around when you're having guests in the house. Cause I love islands. Um, uh, right. but that's what a refresh is. It's not like we're tearing down, we're scraping everything away. A rebrand is that is where they demolish everything and they're building from the ground up again, um, to, to establish that presence. Um, a lot of firms really don't, when, when firms come to us, they don't really need a rebrand, right? Um, they just need that refresh. And so that's what I like about it. Cause I get to take things, uh, certain elements from their brand and just touch it up a little bit and just bring it to light. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with not just the colors, like with colors, we're just changing where maybe we're adding a few colors. Maybe we're just changing like the tints and shades of certain hues. Uh, maybe the messaging is even, uh, you know, clear for the target audience. Maybe the type of tape faces have changed a little bit, but it's really to, we're, we're just touching it up to make it more in line and more cohesive to their target audience is what it is. Right. So, ha, ha, you know, I'm a, I'm a big process guy, right? So I, I'm thinking this through and I'm like, you know, hey, let's say you have one of those instances where somebody needs a complete rebrand, right? Or let's say they had no real brand, right? They, and they're, you know, hey, I'm growing. I really got to get out there. I got to have, you know, some marketing materials. I got to have a better presence. And even from a rebrand, I think there are some things that, you know, would take place over the course of a life of a business that may warrant a rebrand, right? Maybe there was a merger or acquisition that kind of fundamentally changes the firm. So they're, they're not the firm they were a year ago. So they might need that rebrand. So from a process perspective, you go through this whole process, go through that rebranding with them from the ground up. How do you ensure that the process is constantly moving forward? Because I know, especially advisors, especially in this profession, probably a lot of questions get asked, you know, and, you know, what if this, what if that? So how do you make sure that, you know, things are consistently and constantly moving in the right direction where you're going to end up meeting that end goal of this uh, rebrand rather than kind of stalling out along the way um, and, and not seeing it fully through? Great question. Again, uh, trial and error has helped out quite a bit, but also learning from uh, outside sources. But it's really just making sure that the clients understand this is really a collaborative effort. So you want to make sure that all the decision makers are there whether they're in that email chain or they're on those calls, right? Because you don't want to do it without, you know, with one decision maker else, you know, that they're not on the calls or emails because then it might just circle back and keep circling back and it just goes nowhere. Same with financial planning, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you want to have every all the stakeholders, yeah, all the stakeholders involved at the table, right? And knowing what's going on. So very similarly. 100%. And I mean, that, that is huge too, but like from the proposal, there is a page that really communicates like, Hey, this is a collaborative partnership. So we're going to be in touch with you quite often. We typically send a weekly email on Fridays to give them an update on where we're at. 
It might be just a small update. Sometimes it's bigger. Um, and sometimes we'll present them like we'll create like a loom video that, you know, presents them like certain ideas that works with them. Cause what we don't want to do is say, surprise, this is what we made. And they go, this has nothing to do with us. Like this looks cool, but it doesn't match anything that we're trying to perceive. I mean, luckily that hasn't happened, but that can right. easily happen sure. if you keep them out of a loop. Cause there are times when, when we're building out, like, let's say like the logo concepts and, uh, and the different logos that, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're just head down, we're head down, we're building out things and we might not have a lot of things to tell them, but just a little bit of a response or an update really keeps them in a loop, really makes sure that they know where we're at so that it's not been like a month or two months of, you know, two months of no communication. Um, but they under like we have something in our proposal where it says like, hey, this is where this is when we'll touch base with you, and we give them access to a Notion page that tells them like when we'll reach out to them or we'll, we'll hop on a call or when they're going to get a presentation. So they're very in the loop about that. So really, it comes down to just having that open communication with them, updating them frequently, and making sure that they know where you know where we're at. Um, Sometimes scheduling, you know, those calls can be a crosswired a little bit, you know, as in like they're busy, we're busy on a certain wow. date, but we always get the job done. Uh, but having that freaking communication has been a huge priority this year and it has paid off tremendously because now all of our clients and us are on the same page. There has been no barriers, uh, no confusion, and we're very quick to respond to anything our clients uh, ask us to do. Yeah. It sounds like you're a process guy too, which keeps that uh, on on task, which is great. So, so, so one of my favorite people, uh, you know, Matt Halloran. I heard him re re refer to you as a design mind in quotes. His his quotes. So, how do you, right, as an artist, go from a design mind, right, and transition that design to finishing out a brand? Is is that something you find very uh, simple and natural, or is it a little bit more difficult for you? When it goes to finishing out a design, um, I will say if I am the primary designer and it, it is like, uh, let's say the client has chosen my direction from the logos to the colors, to the typography, to the art direction, the, the photo direction, and then it's very easy for me to build it out and finish it. Like it's, it's easy. But if it's not my logo that they chose, because I've worked with um, a couple of other designers, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to to visualize it and to build it out. Um, I mean, it's not it's not very tough, but it is different because then I am now communicating with the designer that build a logo and say like, you know, what's what's your eye for the visual elements, the the website? Like, what do, what are you what are you visualizing for all of this? Let me get inside that mind so I can help you build it out. Uh, so at that point, then it's switching from like a design mind to almost like a a creative director mind um, to to help to make sure that the client is getting the right direction and that everything is cohesive. So it is like switching design to creative director to back to design to help build it out. But uh, for the most part, it is a design mind and it's pretty easy to do. But as we continue to grow and as we bring on more designers, um, you know, I might have to take a step back on the design aspect. Right. And kind of be that creative director and help build it out and probably just be a better, uh, just be like the lead communicator with the clients. But that hasn't happened yet. It probably won't happen for a few more years, but when it does, I'll be ready. Great. Yeah. As the business, uh, you know, uh, goes through its evolution, things change, your role changes, right? It's like the, the person who started the bakery and they were the baker and they were keeping the books. And then next thing they know, they are no longer baking, which was really the love of their life. And they're running a business and they're like, how did this happen? Right. So it's not, not much different there. So, you know, what, one thing I want to ask you, cause I want to leave this for our listeners, because I think this is important because I think a lot of people think about branding, they put time, effort and energy and thinking, you know, are there places or what is the best place for people to go to, to kind of learn about branding? Maybe, you know, whether that's through you or, you know, other resources that are out there to help them navigate that process. 
That's a great question. Um, I mean, they can absolutely follow me. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. I love to build in public, um, but where I I'll tell them where I've learned my stuff. So sure. there's, I mean, you you can learn a lot just by looking up the top designers. Uh, Paul Rand being like an iconic designer, not not the not Rand Paul, but Paul Rand, uh, amazing designer. He he actually designed the Morning Star logo, so there's proof right there. And he did that right. in the '60s, and they haven't changed that at all. So listening to him, I think he actually has a Netflix documentary that talks about his design process, which is awesome. Um, understanding your identity is huge before you build out the visual piece, right? So. If you're wanting to learn more about that, then how, the, the book How the World Sees You by Sally Hogshead is a great source. Um, that's a great book to, to read and learn and, uh, about the different archetypes. And you can take a quiz on which archetype you are and see if that matches up with your brand. Um, and if you're not sure if your brand looks the part, and then you read that book and you figure out your archetype, then you're, you know, you're putting two to two together, right? The archetype is really your North Star. And we do that for a lot of, uh, for all of our clients. We we put them through like a quiz to figure out what their archetype is, because that is their north star, and helping them determine the identity piece. And then we go into the visual aspect of the brand design. Um, but uh, another great piece is uh, a huge idol of mine is uh, Alan Peters. Uh, Alan is spelled A L L A N, and he just uh, created a book about logo identity in his process and that's been a huge wonderful thing to read and and learn from um but instead of just focusing on logos i would tell people to really focus on um the identity piece first because a logo is it's like the salami on a charcuterie board right it's just a, it's just a piece right it's not the full it's not the full board so anything that they can do i would say just google brain identity uh, i'm trying to think here if i have um oh here's the here's the book how the world sees you by sally right. hogshead yeah um it her last name reminds me of hogsmeade from harry potter so there's that <laughs> uh so i like that but really i mean any any book by david uh david Airy, um this book called id is the identity mm -hmm. design the definitive guide to visual branding that's a huge piece too but um mm -hmm. as you can see i try to get my hand on any any design book, but yeah, there's many different routes that you can take. All I can say is that if you truly are interested, then just start, just start with a podcast, start with right. an audiobook. start with anything that you can find on Google and you'll just go down a rabbit hole and you'll find success. Great resources. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And I'm going to, I'm going to check out how the world sees you. I'm going to check that one out myself. So thank you. Thank you for that. So listen, it, it's been great having you on. We talked about joy earlier about the color of my shirt and whatnot. And uh, we're all about joy here. So we ask each of our guests the same last question, which is what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? What I did today, uh, I, I had to take my mother to her doctor's appointment today. And I, you know, so I, I don't normally talk to her in the morning, but you know, that drive and being with her uh, in the hospital and, you know, keeping her company and, and making her feel safe was huge joy. Um, typically I have to consume a lot of caffeine to get into the right mindset, <laughs> but uh, just being there listening to her and just having, you know, just having a talk with her, you know, it just kind of kicked things into gear and it's a Monday. So everyone kind of, you know, starts a little bit slower, Sure. but after, uh, after I left, I just like, it just, I don't know. I felt like, uh, I just revved an engine and I was like, all right, I'm, I was like, well, let's go. It's time to, time to make mama proud. So, awesome. was, yeah, so that, that brought me joy. Awesome. Well, I hope everything went smoothly with her, the doctor, and it uh, went as good as, uh, as expected. And uh, listen, Josh, it's been a pleasure having you on, and we're going to have all of your information in the show notes. Uh, but uh, if people want to learn more about you, connect with you, learn more about the Finn artist, what's the easiest and the best place for them to do that? Um, my website, uh, thefinnartist.com. Uh, all my social handles on there too, but on LinkedIn and Twitter is the Finn artist, um, or my first and last name, Josh Passler. You can find me on there. Um, if you have any questions, uh, do not feel like I'm the type of person that will just ghost you. I love talking about this. So just shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, 
I love to uh, give any tips, anything like that. So uh, I'm an open book. So fire away. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you for sharing your nuggets today on our show. I really appreciate it. And I uh, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. I want to thank Josh Passler for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset. Josh is another great example of someone who brought together his passions, in his case, people and finance, to create a business that he loves. He has found a way to visually show difficult concepts and jargon from within the profession to help the public understand. Not to mention, he makes a hell of a portrait for financial advisors. Josh Passler and The Fin Artist can be found across most social media platforms. All the contact information needed to find them can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Midland Money Mindset. Remember, it's not just about the money. It's finding joy in the journey and embracing the right mindset. If you love the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Don't forget to follow along for more tips and inspiration. Please visit the social links below to connect with Larry or his guests. Until next time, keep smiling, keep thriving, and remember to think about what did you do today that brought you joy?